So hello, everybody. My name is Mrs. Gallier. I'm the high school media specialist here at Ellenville High. I want to give a big shout out to three English teachers that brought their classes today. If you could step closer to the podium so we can get you on film. <laughs> this is Miss Rusa. This is Noelia. What's your last name? I'm sorry. Santiago. Santiago and Jennifer Meyer, another Jennifer. And this is, of course, Jennifer Donnelly. Nice to meet so, you all. Before we begin, some reminders. We tried to socially distance the chairs, but everyone's masks must be up so that we are safe. Thank you. And our discussion today is designed to be respectful and inquisitive, so no interrupting. Avoid the use of profanity, please. And you can ask our author anything. She's very interested in whatever you want to learn about, okay? So um, without further ado, Welcome to a program that we're calling Your Words Matter, Caring Community Conversations. And we're very proud to present our author, a local Hudson Valley, best-selling, versatile, and award-winning author from the Hudson Valley, Jennifer Donnelly. And we've called this program The Magic of Words, Telling Fairy Tales. And um, I just want to give you a little bit of background about Ms. Donnelly. So Jennifer Donnelly is a New York Times bestselling author of 13 novels, including Stepsister, Beauty and the Beast, Lost in a Book, and many others. Her work has garnered many awards, among them a Carnegie Medal, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the Michael L. Prince Honor, and a Green Earth Book Award. She has also gotten other awards for writing young adult novels as well. She lives in New York Cousin Valley, and you can learn more at jenniferdonnelly.com. And there's a place where you can contact her if you'd like to speak with her beyond today's conversation. So, Ms. Donnelly, without further ado, <laughs> welcome aboard. Let's give her a nice welcome, everybody. Thank you so much, Ms. Gallier, and thank you to all of you guys for coming today. So, as Ms. Gallier mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about fairy tales and why I write them, why they're so compelling to me, and then we'll dig into your comments and questions. That's what I really want to hear most of all. I want to hear from you guys. Um, before we get started, just to give you a taste of what I do, I thought I'd read you the first short section from one of my books, Stepsister, which is not so much a fairy tale retelling as it is a continuation of the Cinderella story. Um, it looks at what happens to the ugly stepsisters after Cinderella rides off with her prince and asks a lot of questions, um, mainly what made them ugly and who says that they were ugly and, and why do we let other people call people ugly? Why don't we pull that power back to ourselves? So here's a little taste of stepsister. This is a dark tale, a grim tale. It's a tale from another time. A time when wolves waited for girls in the forest, beasts paced the halls of cursed castles, and witches lurked in gingerbread houses with sugar-kissed roofs. That time is long gone, but the wolves are still here and twice as clever. The beasts remain, and death still hides in a dusting of white. It's grim for any girl who loses her way, grimmer still for a girl who loses herself. Know that it's dangerous to stray from the path, but it's far more dangerous not to. Chapter one. In the kitchen of a grand mansion, a girl sat clutching a knife. Her name was Isabel. She was not pretty. She held the knife's blade over the flames of a fire burning in the hearth. Behind her, sprawled half conscious in another chair, was her sister Octavia. Octavia's face was deathly pale. Her eyes were closed. The once white stocking covering her right foot was crimson with blood. Adelie, the sister's old nursemaid, peeled it off and gasped. Octavia's heel was gone. Blood dripped from the ugly wound where it used to be and pooled on the floor. Though she tried to hold it in, a moan of pain escaped her. Hush, Tavi. Mama scolded. The prince will hear you. Just because your chances are ruined doesn't mean your sisters must be. Mama was the girl's mother. She was standing by the sink, rinsing blood out of a glass slipper. The prince had come searching for the one who'd worn it. He danced all night with a beautiful girl at a masquerade ball three days ago, 
and had fallen in love with her. But at the stroke of midnight, the girl had run away, leaving only a glass slipper behind. He would marry the girl who'd worn it, he vowed, her and no other. Mama was determined that one of her daughters would be that girl. She greeted the royal party in the foyer and requested that Isabel and Octavia be allowed to try the slipper on in privacy, in deference to their maidenly modesty. And the prince had agreed. The Grand Duke had held out a velvet pillow. Mama had carefully lifted the slipper off it and carried it into the kitchen. Her daughters had followed her. We should have heated the blade for Tavi, Mama fretted now. Why didn't I think of it? Heat sears the vessels. It stops the bleeding. Ah, well, it will go better for you, Isabel. Isabel swallowed. But Mama, how will I walk? She asked in a small voice. Silly girl, you will ride in a golden carriage. Servants will lift you in and out. Flames licked the blade. It grew red. Isabel's eyes grew large with fear. She thought of a stallion lost to her now that she had once loved. But Mama, how will I gallop through the forest? The time has come to put such childish pursuits aside, Mama said, drying the slipper. I've bankrupted myself trying to attract suitors for you and your sister. Pretty gowns and fine jewels cost a fortune. A girl's only hope in life is to make a good marriage. And there's no finer match than the Prince of France. I can't do it, Isabel whispered. I can't. Mama put the glass slipper down. She walked to the hearth and took Isabel's face in her hands. Listen to me, child, and listen well. Love is pain. Love is sacrifice. The sooner you learn that, the better. Isabel squeezed her eyes shut. She shook her head. Mama released her. She was silent for a bit. When she finally spoke again, her voice was cold, but her words were scalding. You are ugly, Isabel, dull, lumpy as a dumpling. I could not even convince the schoolmaster's knock-kneed clod of a son to marry you. Now a prince waits on the other side of the door, a prince, Isabel, and all you have to do to make him yours is cut off a few toes, just a few useless little toes. Mama wielded shame like an assassin wields a dagger, driving it straight into her victim's heart. She would win, she always won, Isabel knew that. How many times had she cut away parts of herself at her mother's demand? The part that laughed too loudly, that rode too fast and jumped too high, the part that wished for a second helping, more gravy, a bigger slice of cake. If I marry the prince, I will be a princess, Isabel thought, and one day a queen, and no one will dare call me ugly ever again. She opened her eyes. Good girl, be brave, be quick, Mama said. Cut at the joint. Isabel pulled the blade from the flames and tried to forget the rest. So that's a little taste of stepsister. And as you can see, it's not based on the Disney version of Cinderella where, you know, the ugly stepsisters just had big feet and they tried to cram their toes into the glass slipper. In the Grimm's version, um, their stepmother, their mother, actually, Ella's stepmother, actually urges them to cut off pieces of their feet in order to fit into that slipper. Um, so a question I get asked a lot is, you know, why tell, why retell these old tales that are sometimes very violent, very bloody, um, very dark? Why do they still matter? These fairy tales, many of them are hundreds of years old. Some of them are thousands of years old. So we human beings have changed a lot. We've evolved a lot since they were first told. So why do they continue all these centuries later to have this really strong hold over us? I have a two-part answer to that question. I've been thinking about it for a while. And the first part is that fairy tales still matter so much because they help us understand ourselves. Fairy tales are these things that allow us to have our deepest fears and our deepest desires spoken aloud by the storyteller and then have them resolved safely and, and pretty happily. Things like the fear of loss, the fear of abandonment, the fear of death, or our desires for things like security and success and true love. 
Um, and I'm just wondering, does all that sound a bit like psychotherapy to you guys? Um, if so, I think that's really because it is. Because before we had things like psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, before people like Freud and Jung tried to explain the human consciousness, we had storytellers. And, and I really happen to think that storytellers were humanity's sort of first psychotherapist. Um, they recognize that our childhood experiences, that those strong fears and those desires, um, sometimes that trauma as well, had much to do with our development. And they addressed that. They really took it head on. Fairy tales tell us, um, fairy tales like Hansel and Gretel or Snow White or Cinderella, they tell us a very important truth. And that's that the world can be a very hard and dark and violent place sometimes, full of witches and wolves and monsters. But they also tell us something even more profound, that we can beat those monsters, that we have everything inside of us. We have guts and smarts and courage and shrewdness, everything we need to defeat the monsters, to do better, you know, to best the witch, to push her in the oven instead of being pushed in the oven. They tell us <laughs> that we have everything we need to, to get out of that dark woods and make our way home. So that's one part of the answer as to why I retell fairy tales and, and why they're so compelling to me. And I think the second part of that answer is because I've always wanted answers to my unanswered questions about the stories ever since I was a little kid. If we take Cinderella, for example, um, I was probably five years old the first time I heard that story, the first time my grandmother read it to me. And I loved it, but I wanted to know so much more when she closed the covers to the book. I wanted to know what had happened to the ugly stepsisters and why were they ugly? Was it because they had big noses and big feet and kind of crazy hair and they were skinny and gawky? Because I was all those things. I had a big nose. I had big feet. I was skinny and gawky. I still am. And if that <laughs> meant they were ugly, did it mean I was ugly? Or look at the tale of Snow White, which was the basis for my second book, Poisoned. Um, the thing that scared me so much about that tale wasn't the evil queen or the witch and her apple. It was that voice in the mirror, just this creepy, weird, disembodied voice that was coming out of the mirror and constantly telling the queen everything that she wasn't. I wanted to know who was it, you know, and what did he want and why did she listen to him? She was this incredibly powerful woman, this, this ruler, a queen. Why did she just let him take away all her power? So that's a bit about why I tell fairy tales and why I'm so compelled and engaged by them. I'm working on my third one right now. And um, what I'd love to do right now is stop talking and chattering quite so much and, and kind of turn it around on you guys and see if you have any questions or comments about these books or my other books or writing in general. I find a lot of people your age are very curious and puzzled by the process of, of getting an idea you know, to a book, to an agent, to a publisher, and out in the world. So if you want to ask questions about that whole process, go right ahead. Thank you. How many people were shocked by the reading of Stepsister, that telling of Cinderella? You watched a movie called Cinderella? Yeah, it was, was it a Disney version? No, you watched a different one? Okay. There are lots of different versions, but they didn't involve this violent cutting off of parts of the feet. Although the original Grimm's fairy tale did, am I correct? Yes. So that's really interesting, this tale from 500 years ago. Does anybody have a question? Whoops, sorry. Do you have a question that you'd like to ask the author? Don't, don't panic, I'm not gonna force you to use the mic. <laughs> do, you, do you have a question? Yes, great. And please say your name first. Uh, I'm Eva. Hi, Eva. <laughs> Hi. I just want to say I have read Stepsisters before, a slight beginning of it, and I just really like the way you write. Thank you. But um, my question is, is there a specific like book or author that really inspired you to write like this? Yes, probably every book I've ever read has inspired me in, in some degree. But when I was a kid, um, as I mentioned, when I was like five, six, my grandmother was reading me the Disney versions of the um, classic fairy tales. And then when I got a bit older, maybe around nine or 10, I went to my public library on the weekends, like I always did. And the librarian knew me really well. And she knew I loved fairy tales. And she said, hey, have you ever read the Grimm's Brothers versions of the fairy tales? And I said, no. And she put that book into my hand and it changed my life. Um, it, it really acknowledged to me, um, for me, something that the, 
the Disney versions weren't acknowledging. And that's that, you know, the world is a dark place. And they're unlike, you know, when you're a kid, your parents and your teachers and, and your ministers and your priests, they're all trying to kind of protect you. They don't want you to know, um, you know, how, how bad the world can be at times, how cruel and violent it can be to people at times. And I kind of sensed that um, when I was a little kid, it was I was growing up in the 70s and um, I would, you know, be on the on the floor at night with my coloring books, kind of listening to the news as my parents watch it. And I would hear terms like Vietnam and Watergate and Nixon. And I wouldn't understand what was going on. And my parents were, you know, not really that inclined to explain it to me. Either they were tired or they were distracted or I think now maybe they were a bit scared, you know, of the world itself, too, and, and what it meant for a kid. And so this was kind of all in my mind sort of you know percolating and i didn't understand a lot of it and i felt when i read the grimm's fairy tales when i read you know the, the this idea that yeah the world is hard it's difficult but you can overcome the monsters you can overcome the witches you can make your way out of the woods that changed my life so that's a very long-winded answer to your question that's a great answer good question too so i think most of us, especially coming out of the last year, have a sense of how dark things can be. Yes. And as I've been talking to students and reconnecting after our year online together, um, one of the things they've been talking about is how their own awareness of some of the world's struggles increased, it's sort of Black Lives Matter, yeah. um, gun control, and some of these other issues that we've been dealing with that are really significant justice issues right wearing masks whether or not to vaccinate all of these questions came exactly. up and so how do we answer those and so um what are some of your responses to that and how does that relate to telling fairy tales what else do fairy tales do they promise us a happy ending yeah no some do okay do. great yes. did you want to say anything more okay fair Fair point. Does anybody have a question or another response to that? Okay. Anybody else want to address a question to our author? Great. Please say your name. Thanks. Hi, I'm Janine Rusta. Hi there. Uh, which of your books is your favorite and why? Oh, that's like asking me which of my children is my favorite. Um, I only have one child, so luckily she's my one and my only and my favorite. <laughs> but it's... um. I, I guess the best answer to that question is whatever book I'm working on at the moment, just because the relationship is so, you know, vivid and, and, and passionate and I'm so close to those characters. And then when I finish the book, you know, they, they wave goodbye and they go on their way and I, I likely don't hear from them again. And that's very sad to me. And that's one of the reasons I'm desperate to always start a new book the minute I finish an old one. So um, I think that's probably the best answer I can give. It's that whatever I'm working on currently. So one of your quotes is, and this is from Poison. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes, please say your name. Hi, my name is Giselle. And just, when did you start re, um, writing books? I started writing my first book when I was in my early 20s. Um, I was always writing in school. I was always writing little stories and really bad poems. Um, when I got into high school, I wrote for my lit magazine, for my newspaper, same in college. I wrote for, um, for a newspaper. And then my first one of my first real jobs was as a reporter for an upstate New York daily paper, the Watertown Daily Times. Um, and I started writing my first novel, which was The Tea Rose, which is a book, um, it's a, a trilogy sort of rags to riches set in London and New York in the 19th century. Um, I started when I was 24. I didn't have um, you know, time for a writer's group. I didn't have money to go to grad school. So I would just get up in the morning before I went to work around 4.30 and try to write a novel. And I had to sort of teach myself how to do it. And I worked on that book for about 10 years, um, finally had what I thought was a saleable manuscript. It was about 1,100 pages long. It was huge. This thing was this big. Um, and so then I went through the process you go through when you have a novel to sell. I tried to find an agent. I didn't know what I was doing there either. So I just got this book. I think it was called The Writer's Guide to Agents and Editors. And I kind of went through and I thought, oh, this sounds good. That sounds good. And I kind of carpet bombed a lot of agencies in the city. Um, waited to hear back from them. I didn't know that that's actually not how you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to query one agent at a time, wait till he or she says yes or no, and then go on to the second one. But luckily, one of the agents I really liked the most, um, Simon Lipscar, wrote me back and he said, this sounds interesting. Let me see a sample of your work. So I sent him about 40 pages and he said, all right, I like these. Let me see the whole manuscript. 
So I sent the whole manuscript and he, he took his time to read it. And he got back to me and said, you know, the good news is you can write, Jennifer. The bad news is this is way too long and we need to work a lot on structure, on pacing, on narrative tension. So I went back and I probably rewrote that book and worked on it for almost another two years. So at this point, I have 12 years of my life invested in this manuscript and we got it down to what we thought was a, a manageable amount, page count, and thought we had a saleable manuscript. And Simon went out and submitted it to pretty much every publishing house in the city. And then I got rejected by pretty much every publishing house in the city. And it was devastating. At this point, I'd been working on this book for 12 years of my life, you know, all through my 20s into my 30s. And that's a, you know, a point where I'm watching other people get ahead. My friends who are doctors and lawyers and bankers are getting ahead and enjoying a lot of success in their career. And I'm still kind of cobbling together this weird freelance life and working on this book. And it, it was awful. And Simon said, you know, take a deep breath, come in off the ledge. We'll try to submit again in, in a few months. And we did. And it was maybe six months later. And there had been some movement among publishing houses of editors and a young editor at St. Martin's named Sally Kim bought the manuscript not for very much money at all, especially considering the years of work I'd put into it, into it. But that night I was so happy. I got a bottle of champagne and I got up on my dining room table and danced because I was finally going to publish this book and I was finally going to be an author. And I tell you this very long winded story because there's one thing up, um, that I learned that I want to share with you guys. And it's this, that nobody could ever guarantee me that I was going to get published but one person could guarantee that I wouldn't. And that was me if I quit. Mm. So as you guys go through life, I don't know that all of you want to be writers, but I'm sure you want to be something, maybe actors or singers or video game programmers or doctors or lawyers. It's a hard path often. And I just want you to, to take that story with you, keep it in your hearts and never be the one who says no to yourself. The whole world sometimes is ready and willing to tell you no. So don't say no to yourselves. Thank you. Good, good to remember when you're an adult as well. Yep. So, uh, the, great. Who's next? <laughs> How about I hand it? Hello, I'll hand it to you. Yeah. Say your name first, and then we'll come back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kaylee, and my question is: Do you think any of the stories you'll write will have a lore to a different one? Will, will sort of lead to a different one? Yeah. Yeah, they, they tend to. Stepsister led to poison, you know, because more questions were perking in my head about the classic fairy tales, more things I wanted answered. And that's led to the third one in um, the trilogy that I'm writing. I can't talk about it yet because the editor and the publisher haven't announced it. But yeah, one story kind of does lead to another, whether it's in a series um, or whether they're standalones. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Sorry, Brian, excuse me. Please go ahead. Say your name. Um, Gage, and did you always want to be a writer? I did from when I was tiny. Um, I had a mom, I still have her, she's still around, who is German and she was a wonderful storyteller. And she would often tell me stories about her life. She was a small child in Germany during World War II in a northern port town, um, which was heavily bombed by the Allies. So when all my little friends were settling down for the night, you know, with nice little fairy tales, I was hearing what life was like in Germany under the Third Reich. And I might hear, what it was like to be eight years old and, you know, have um, planes with air sirens going off over your head and run from your house to the air raid shelter only to come out a few, you know, hours later to find that your house and everything in it had burned to the ground. Or she might tell me a story um, about the neighborhood snot nose, this kid whose name was Herbert, who had joined the Hitler Youth. And every time this kid got in trouble, he would run in his house and put on his Hitler Youth uniform because when he had it on, he was property of the state. And nobody, not even his parents, could touch him. Or she might tell me about her friend Harold, who was a young boy who had cerebral palsy. And they would put him in a wheelbarrow and kind of take him, wheel him around to wherever they were playing. She would tell me what it was like to see his mother come running out of the house, terrified, and, and grab her son and run back into the house and hide him in the coat closet because she had heard the Nazi health inspectors were coming to town and she didn't want her boy to be taken away. So these were the kind of stories I was getting at night. And some say, you know, oh, that might be too much. Um, that might be too harrowing for a kid. But I didn't feel that way. I would sit up in my bed and I would ask my mother a million questions. What happened next? What did you do, mom? How did you feel? And I think that what was happening to me at that point was my mother was making both a storyteller 
and a historian out of me because since I was tiny, a little child, I craved stories, I wanted to hear them. And as soon as I could write and start stitching letters into words and words into sentences, I wanted to be a writer. Thank you. You're Any welcome. more questions? Hannah, did you want to ask? So I'm Hannah. I'm Hannah. Um, and I just wanted to ask, like, um, like, do you have a fairy, a favorite fairy tale, like, ever? Like, oh gosh, I love so many of them for so many different reasons in so many different ways. I would say, you know, I often dip back into the whole Grimm's collection just to sort of remind myself of some of the lesser ones. There's a really crazy one about it's. I think it's called the Sausage, the Bird, and the Mouse. And it's these three creatures who live together and they all have their jobs. Like the sausage has to jump in the soup and, and stir it and get flavor into the soup. And I think the, the mouse cooks and the bird gets the firewood. And one day they all get really, really disgruntled and fed up and they start blaming each other and saying, you don't work as hard as I do. Your job is so much easier than mine. And they all change places and disaster ensues. This, you know, like a cat eats the sausage and something kills the bird. And I think the mouse is left. And you know, the moral of the story is don't complain and, and don't wish for so much more than you had. It seems very Germanic to me. So that's one of the that's one of my favorites. This like crazy, insane fairy tale. Thank you. So one of your most uh, popular novels, especially when you were first beginning, was Northern Light. Mm -hmm. And this is a historical novel, and it's a true story that took place in the Hudson Valley. Am I right? It took place in the Adirondacks. In the Adirondacks, sorry. Yep. Okay, north of here. Yep. So when you research, how do you go about finding good primary sources, good original documents and diaries? That's a good question. Um, for a Northern Light or, or for my book, Revolution, which is another young adult historical, what I try to do first, um, in the case of revolution, I try to, it's set during the French Revolution, which is you know a big broiling political event, spaced over many years, has many players. So I read a big historic, what's called it like a survey, a big historical secondary um, source book on it. In that case, it was Citizens by Simon Shama. And that's gonna give me all the names, you know, the dates, the places, the major players, what happened when, and then I start digging into the bibliography of a book like that, you know, digging for those primary sources because I've heard the overview and now I want to hear the voices. I want to hear, I want to read the diaries and the letters and the, the last wills and testaments. Um, when you write a book set in 18th century Paris, um, that was before photography. So I'm all, I also traveled to Paris for that research. I, you know, had to consult a lot of artwork, um, portraits, landscapes. What did the city look like in 1780, 1790? Um, I want to hear the language. I want to go um, a lot of the places um, in the revolution in Paris still exist. I want to put myself in them and feel them at different times. For a northern light, I would um, get in my car, for example, and do the distances that I have a mule and a cart doing to make sure that that animal could actually make those runs. I dug into, I went to the local historical societies, dug into tax records, read old magazines, read newspapers. Um, that's a murder story, a Northern Light, a young pregnant woman was murdered by the father of her child. She was drowned in Big Moose Lake. And um, the museum up there, the Blue Mountain Museum has a lot of artifacts. They have um, menus and they have bills from the old hotels where this um, young woman stayed before she was killed. They have a lock of her hair. The body was fished out of the lake and a lock of some of her hair caught on the hook that fished the body out and someone wrapped that hair around his finger and it was saved and preserved in the collection. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to understand all the big names, dates, places, faces, but I need to dig deeper than that. I need to really uh, reach back into the past and clasp hands with the people who lived and I need to understand who they were, how they loved, who they loved. I need to really get into their souls. And to do that, you have to get away from those secondary sources and you have to embrace those primary sources and you have to dig in as deeply and as broadly as you can. That's a really long winded, winded answer. Um, and it's, it's more of an art than a science. Yeah. And I imagine in my research and primary documents, they often reach back to me. So as you're mm -hmm. reading a document, you'll find a tip of someplace else to look. Yes, absolutely. And so it's sort of the magic of research that you're led on this path that you didn't necessarily set out to find. 
which brings us back to fairy tales. And also, I wanted to take a moment as we near the end of our time that went really fast um, to nice. reach out to the folks who are joining us online. We do have a couple teachers who are online with us, and I wanted to see if their classes have any questions for us. And so you can enter these in the chat box, or um, John will unmute you if you raise your hand or let him know. Okay. There we go. Good, thank you. Hi, this is Ms. Burke. I put, Hi, Ms. Burke. I put something in the chat, a question in the chat. Okay, great. Um, Kay, can I ask you to read that for me, please? The question in the chat? I think I've got it. I was wondering which books you recommend for younger teens and which for older. It, it depends a lot, Ms. Burke, on the maturity of the reader. Um, I would say the fairy tale retellings are for 14 and up. I would also say um, Northern Light, Revolution are more for high schoolers. They, they do have some rather dark subject matter and some adult situations in them. I hope that's helpful. Things like Lost in a Book, um, the, the Water Fire Saga, that's uh, really good for middle schoolers, even some, some elementary schoolers. Thank you, and thank you, Kay, for reading. Got another question? Great, yes. Thank you. How do you deal with burnout and writer's block? Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, I take a break between books and that helps with the burnout. It's, it's an intense thing writing a novel. Um, deadlines are always pressing in on me and um, I'm contractually bound to meet them and that's a lot of pressure. So I do take a break between novels. As for writer's block, I love talking about that. Um, I don't believe in it. I, I think that it's, um, I don't know, maybe a lazy writer invented the term 400 years ago because he or she didn't want to do their work. Um, and I think especially, I wish the term would kind of fall into disuse because I think it's especially poisonous for younger writers. I, I feel like when I was your age, you know, someone said writer's block, I imagine this big granite block kind of just dropping on me and, and, and obliterating sort of all my work and all my thoughts about writing. And it seems like you can't get around it. So it's, it's not a term I really like. Um, I, I think we should reframe it as just getting stuck, which happens all the time to writers. It happens whether you're writing a novel, whether you're writing a script or poetry. It happens to painters. It happens to video game programmers. It happens to detectives working on case. It's part of doing good work. Getting stuck just means that you have to pull back a little bit, rethink, you know, maybe redraft and start again. And it's that starting again that often differentiates, you know, an idea from a finished book. Um, it's something that I wish I could say it got easier as you get older and as you have you know, many novels under your belt. It doesn't. I still get completely freaked out by the blank page, you know, by deadlines, by time pressures. Um, I do have one thing I do though when I get uh, stuck and that's um, to get away from my computer. I get paper you know, from my, re my little recycling paper pile. I get a pen. I turn away from the computer and I start writing longhand and I start asking myself questions. Sometimes they're very specific. Why is this book um, lagging in chapter four? Why is there no suspense um, you know, by chapter eight? Why is the dialogue so flat? Why is this character two dimensional? Sometimes if I can't get that specific, I'll just write this question. Why does this book stink so badly? And then I'll sit back, I'll sit back a bit and the answers start coming. It's almost like this weird Ouija board effect and I start writing out the answers. And when I have them, I can start working again. But don't, don't beat yourself up too much over this thing called writer's block. It's, it's, it's just getting stuck. It's just part of the process. It's part of the work. It's perfectly normal. Thank you. I'm afraid we're almost out of time. So again, if you go to jenniferdonnelly.com, you can communicate. She has a wonderful blog. And um, does anybody have any final questions? Yes. What's the longest time that you spent on a book? The longest time I've spent on a book would be that first one I wrote, The Tea Rose, when I was trying to teach myself how to write a novel, and that was over 10 years. I'm, I'm happy to say my time's gotten a little better as I've gone on. I would say now books take me anywhere from a year to a year and a half, um, start to finish. And I once did one for Disney where I had to knock out the first draft that was lost in a book in four months, which was really, really hard. But 
it, it taught me an important lesson, which is just get that first draft down, you guys, whether it's um, a poem that you're writing or a story or um, a, a more, you know, sort of an analytical piece. The first draft is going to be horrible. It's going to be awful. It's going to stink. It always does. It doesn't matter who you are as a writer. That first draft really is awful, and it doesn't get better until you start redrafting two, three, four, five times. There are parts of my novels that have been redrafted 25 times. So that's part of the process, too, and just keep that in mind as you're working. Thank you. I think we have one more virtual question from oh. Ms. Linhart. Can, Kay, can you read the question out loud from the chat box, please? Is there, John? I'm sorry. She didn't type one in. Oh, she raised oh, her yes, hand. I, yes. one, I have a student who would like to ask a question. Sure. It's okay, go on. Where do you get your ideas for your new book? Where do they Great come? They, they often just sort of bubble up from the unconscious or sometimes I'll read something or hear something. For Northern Light, I read, um, uh, it was, as I mentioned, a murder case. So I read a, a non-fictional account. I read the fictional account of the case, which was an American tragedy. And they spoke to me so strongly and, and they just built so much emotion in me. The idea of this young woman being murdered and, and how sad that was. And the letters that she left behind that were actually written to her murderer before he murdered her. They, they, they built such strong emotion in me that I had to get that emotion out the way writers do by writing a story. So it's, it's sometimes based on a question that's just been perking in my mind for years, and it's sometimes it's based on something that I see or hear or read. Thank you. Great questions, everyone. I really appreciate your um, participation. So uh, great. They're just keen Thank to you applaud. Guys. Well done. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to the American Library Association. So this author visit today was made possible by a program called Libraries Transforming Communities, a focus on small and rural libraries. These are our afternoon announcements, so we'll have to edit this part out. But Ms. Donnelly, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure meeting you, and we look forward to, to communicating. Oops, I think you guys are so oh. well, just want to say thank you so much. Um, during COVID, usually I'm on the road traveling in high schools and, and middle schools in person. And I really enjoy that. And I miss that. So spending time with all you guys and hearing your wonderful questions and comments means a lot to me. Thank you. So thank you all very much. You've been a great three classes. Thank really loved guys. having you here. Did a good job. Thank you for your questions. Thank you.